All right, hello again. Uh, looks like most have joined and we can begin the presentation. My name is Edgar, I am with the AEE Solar team, and I'm very excited to introduce you all to our presenter today. We are joined by senior trainer at Enphase, Tony Vernetti. Uh, in today's live training, Tony will teach us about sizing an Enphase IQ battery system, best practices for an initial site survey, and a lot more. As a reminder, we will have a Q&A session following the presentation. I encourage you to submit your questions via the questions section located on your control panel at any point during the live training. Once the live training has concluded, we will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. All right, let's dive in. Without further ado, I'll pass it over to you, Tony, and we can start. All right, thanks for the introduction, Edgar. I appreciate it. Um, okay, I'm going to transfer. I'm going to share my screen here and we'll get started. All right, so for those of you that have been selling storage for a while, you'll you know that it's it's a little bit of a different animal, or I should say <laughs> quite a bit of a different animal than selling PV by itself. There are many other factors that need to be considered, such as the priority of the uh, of the function of the, of the battery system, whether it's for backup power or savings with, with time of use utility rates or self-consumption, a few different ways. So you need to understand what the customer's priority is and be able to size the system so it meets their needs and also you know, convey to the customer that you know what you're doing, uh, that the system is gonna be optim optimized for their needs and is gonna work reliably. So the first thing that we're going to cover are these concepts of energy and power. It's, these are really the fundamental concepts that you need to understand backward and forward in order to properly size a system. So we've got a couple slides here that kind of walks us through these concepts. So sizing an energy storage system properly is going to accomplish three main things. The first is that it's going to ensure that the system has enough power excuse me, let me step back, have enough energy capacity to be able to last long enough for that homeowner. And that, so energy relates to basically how long the battery is going to last given a certain amount of power demand, whether that's four hours or 10 hours or 16 hours, et cetera. And secondly, it's going to ensure that the system will have enough power to be able to run those homes, that home's loads. Every electrical device in the home requires a different amount of power. So you got a bunch of things running all at the same time. The system needs to be able to output the combined power of everything in order to sustain uh, those loads and to keep a stable microgrid and reliable power for that homeowner. And lastly, this item is sometimes overlooked or kind of skipped. The system needs to be designed so that it has enough peak power to be able to start all the appliances that are connected to the, the uh, microgrid. And that's important because some appliances require a lot of extra power for a second or two when the system first starts up. So the battery needs to be able to uh, handle that, that kind of increased demand for that first couple seconds. The batteries in our system and really all energy storage systems have their capacity stated in kilowatt hours. And that's because that's how we're measuring energy consumption at people's homes. Our IQ battery 10 has a capacity in kilowatt hours of 10. And if you know our system um, from attending previous sessions or from selling it, you'll know that the building block of the IQ battery 10 is actually a 3.3 kilowatt hour battery. So there are three smaller units under this big cover, but the total capacity of one of these units is 10 kilowatt hours. And with any, uh, with a single system, you can have up to four of these larger batteries, which would be 40 kilowatt hours of capacity. That's the largest system you can have with one of our system controllers. The simplest analogy uh, for energy capacity is the capacity of a fuel tank. Think of the kilowatt hour capacity as like the size of the gas tank on your, your truck. A larger capacity truck, I'm sorry, a larger capacity fuel tank can store more energy or fuel than a small fuel tank. 
So now let's talk about power because oftentimes these terms power and energy are mixed up or misused. So power is actually a rate or the speed at which energy is consumed or produced. That's why we can use the word power when it comes to solar panels, their DC power rating, for example, but it also applies to uh, consuming power. You know, a, an air conditioner or an appliance like a microwave is gonna have a different power requirement. So in this example, an air conditioner, uh, this is very typical for like a mid-sized, fairly modern air conditioner is gonna use somewhere around three or 4,000 watts continuously. So that would be considered quite a large amount of power. Whereas something like a television uses a relatively small amount of power. So the larger the appliance, the more power it's gonna consume. So the battery needs to be able to output that power to have a stable and reliable microgrid. And of course, the larger the load, the larger the power uh, consumption level, the faster that energy is gonna consumed in that battery. So if you're trying to power that air conditioner, that battery is gonna drain down a lot faster than if you're powering smaller loads like televisions. Here we have the power rating of uh, say a two IQ battery 10 system. So that's 20 kilowatt hours of energy capacity and its continuous output power would be about 7.7 .7 kilowatts. So plenty of power to run that, that uh, air conditioner we had on the previous page. And a peak output power of 11.2 kilowatts. So that if you can uh, do the math, you can see it's 50% higher than the continuous power is the peak output power for up to 10 seconds. So sometimes you need to figure out how much energy something is gonna use. So you know that the power of a certain device or appliance, and if you know how long it's gonna operate on an average day, then it's very simple math to figure out how much energy you need to account for with that battery in order to for that battery to last the length of time that's required. So in this example, we have an appliance that uses a thousand watts or one kilowatt. If that appliance is on for 10 hours straight, then you simply multiply one kilowatt by 10 and you'd get 10 kilowatt hours of energy. That's a little bit inaccurate with air conditioners because ACs don't run continuously, right? They run until the temperature in the room is where it needs to be and then they'll stop for a while. So kind of soft, but it, for the sake of this image here, if you're assuming that that appliance is on continuously, the motor's running continuously for that 10 hour period, it would consume 10 kilowatt hours. If you are powering this load solely with a battery and when you're disconnected from the utility grid, the power output of that battery needs to be at least a kilowatt, again, for that microgrid to be stable. If the demand of that appliance jumps or the total demand of all the devices in the home jumps well above the power output, then that system is gonna collapse essentially. That's not what you want your homeowners to experience. You want them to have reliable, consistently, available um, backup power. Now a little bit more about um, power surge that occurs with certain types of appliances. So this is primarily a concern with appliances that have a motor. You might not think of an air conditioner or a refrigerator as having a motor, but you actually have a little motor that's running a compressor in that system. And many types of motors, the most inexpensive and common types of motors have what's called inrush current for a couple of seconds when they first start up. And that means that the amount of power that they demand is actually about six times, it varies, but in this example, about six times more power than it needs when it's just running continuously. So you can see that's illustrated here by the spike in power demand. So for about two seconds, about 6,000 watts, but when it's running continuously, about 1,000 watts. So this is why it's very important to size the battery to be able to handle the starting surge. And there are also some additional strategies like using soft starters when you can. Here we have a little more information about the two battery sizes that we offer as two building blocks, or the building blocks, I should say. So the, the IQ battery on the left is the smallest building block of the system. It's 3.36 kilowatt hours of energy capacity. So that's the size of the fuel tank, so to speak. And its power output is 1.28 kilowatts or 1.92 kilowatts. 
the IQ Battery 10 is essentially three of those IQ Battery 3s connected to each other with one large cover. And because of the way the system is all interconnected, all that, the energy and power numbers are additive. So if you have three Battery 3s, you simply multiply the energy and power numbers by three to figure out what it would be for the 10. The same, the same is true for going larger all the way up to 40 kilowatt hours. So in setting expectations with your homeowner, it's important to be realistic. You don't want them to have a, a poor understanding of what they can actually power with their battery. If they you know, try to power too many things, their system is likely gonna collapse and you're gonna get a phone call and FaZe might get a phone call saying, hey, what's up with the system? I thought I could run XYZ and my system's not working. <laughs> so in order to, for them to have a good experience and refer you more business in the future, Let's do everything that we can to set realistic expectations. So the IQ Battery 3, if this was the size of the battery that's installed on the home, you really need to keep the electrical loads to a minimum because the power output and the energy capacity is quite small for a home. This is really meant to be a building block to customize the size of the system specifically for the homeowner's needs, but it's not really intended to be the only battery for the home, but it can be. Um, if you're talking to a customer that really understands what they're getting into and they just want to power a couple of small devices in their home, then they could get by with an IQ Battery 3. So we have a couple of examples here, just LED, very efficient LED lights. I'd say a modern and efficient refrigerator could be powered by a 3 overnight. Um, and then small things like charging your phones, perhaps running some fans. Now, if the customer wants to use any kitchen appliances like their microwave or a coffee maker or watch their big entertainment system like you know their 60 inch TV and everything that goes along with it, then they would need to have at least an IQ battery 10 so that not just for the energy capacity, but so that it has enough power to be able to handle those additional items plus their base loads of keeping their fridge going and their lights, et cetera. So here you can see it says recommended for partial backup or partial home backup. Um, for the vast majority of your customers, I'd say uh, start your re recommended sizing at an IQ battery 10 at a minimum and go up from there. And again, because we have a modular system where you can add batteries as small as 3.3 kilowatt hours, it's easy for homeowners to say, start with an IQ battery 10, see if that meets their needs. And if they want to add more batteries in the future, they can contact you to do that. We try to make it as easy as possible to add more batteries to our system. If the homeowner has to run some large appliances that are on 240 volt circuits, then we would recommend at least two IQ battery 10s at a minimum. Um, and also for whole home backup, you can say you can see that's stated here. Minimum for whole home backup would be two IQ battery 10s or IQ battery 20. The main reason again is power output. Larger appliances that are on 240 volt circuits are typically gonna be demanding more power than a single IQ battery 10 can output. So if they've got an air conditioner or if they've got a well pump or pool pump or an electric water heater, things like that, they really need to have at least two IQ battery 10s And going in that same vein of thinking, if they have multiple large appliances, say two air conditioners or an air conditioner and a water heater that has to run simultaneously, then the system should probably have either three or four of the IQ battery tents. So there is no one single size system necessarily that's gonna be good for all customers. It really depends on what their requirements are. And that's why we provide this free tool available at estimator.enphase.com. We call this the Enphase System Planner that makes it really easy to figure out what the right size battery is for that customer's loads. And we're gonna spend some time doing some examples with the estimator here in a couple minutes. So actually, let me just pause to see if there were any, question, uh, any questions that have been typed in so far, Edgar. Uh, no questions at this time. No questions, okay. Okay, so give me a second to bring up the estimator on my
my shared screen here. Okay, so if you go to the Enphase.com uh, website and click on Homeowners, you'll see a link here that says Design My System. This will take you to the System Planner. Or just you know navigate to it and then bookmark it so it's easy to find. On the left, you have your input screen or your input section. And I recommend just leaving it on, on new to end phase. You can potentially log in with the customer's information, like their, their ID and password, if they already have an end phase solar system, and it'll in, import some details. But for mo most cases, you're just going to be starting from scratch. So say, I'm new to end phase, put in the address. I recommend putting in the complete address because that way it's actually going to, uh, their address is going to be on the report that you can share with them at the end. So they'll know that this system size is, is customized specifically for their home at this address and it's not some sort of generic recommendation. Okay, let me type an address in here. I can remember my own address. There we go. And then for electricity consumption, if you have the information, which in most cases you are going to have the kilowatt hours per month because you're probably sizing for solar as well, just click the little pencil icon here and change that to month and enter in the kilowatt hours per month right here. And then uh, it asks you in an outage, the customer needs backup of how many hours. So the default here is 16. The idea being this is uh, preparing the homeowner for a multiple day or prolonged power outage that, that's um, uh, gonna, be, well, basically multiple days. So it's 16 hours of backup power. That means that if there's actually no solar input at all, that this system will be able to run the homeowner's loads for 16 hours before the energy is depleted. Um, the, uh, in an ideal world, there would be enough sunshine the next day to re be able to recharge that battery. So as long as it's sunny continuously day after day after day, the homeowner will have backup power actually for many, many days. Now here you can select a few appliances. This is really more for a homeowner who uh, wants to see just an initial system sizing and be contacted by an installer. But for you as solar professionals, you just want to click show system estimate. And then up here you'll see additional configuration. It does recommend a solar and battery size based on those minimal inputs that you put in, but to actually refine the system size and design, uh, and to be able to select the specific electrical loads that the customer has, this is where you need to go. So again, let me show you that once you select, or, or once you submit the information on that first page, you want to click on additional configuration, this link right here. So here we have an appliance selector, and it's broken down into a few sections here. So the first section here is essential appliances. So here we have eight appliances or devices that are very typical for homeowners to consider to be essential. Obviously lighting and refrigeration, computers are essential items. Microwave and coffee machine, these may or may not be essential. Um, it's worth asking the, the homeowner if they have these, if they, if they need to power these with their battery because these are heating appliances and anything that is used for heating uses a lot more power than people really realize in general. Uh, I'll say from my experience, so if they don't have a microwave, select, deselect backup, same for coffee maker. <clears throat> now on all these you can see you've got quantities and the ability to edit the inputs here so you can actually reduce or increase the number of these devices. Lighting is pretty minimal, but if a customer has two refrigerators they need to back up, so they've got one in their kitchen and one in their garage, like many people do, you want to definitely change the quantity to two here. <clears throat> and you can also refine, like really get specific with the energy consumption, or sorry, I'm mixing up the terms myself, the power consumption of this device as well. So if you know the power consumption of a refrigerator, uh, you can actually enter that here. 
something. This is worth doing for televisions, in my opinion, because TVs, the amount of power they consume is really all over the place. Uh, plasma TVs, which were popular a few years ago, consume actually a lot of energy compared to more modern OLED or, or other types of technologies. Now the next section down here is for large appliances, and this is where it gets, this is uh, really important to understand how this works for proper sizing. So here you have to select, the, you have to toggle back up on for any of these large appliances that are gonna be backed up by the system. And then it factors that component or that appliance into the sizing of the battery. So you can see here without the air conditioner selected, the recommended battery size here at the bottom is 10 kilowatt hours. But if you toggle that on for air conditioner, so we're backing up the air conditioner, the size of the battery increases from 10 to 20 kilowatt hours. And the reason for that is surge power. So on the bottom here, you can see this link to expand to view more details. If you do that, it brings up this little page here where it tells you what is the main factor that's driving the size of the battery. Is it how much energy capacity is needed or how much power or surge power? It could be any of these three items. So in this case, basically in order to run all their essential appliances, plus be able to start and run that air conditioner, the battery needs to be 20 kilowatt hours so that that battery has enough power output or surge power output to start that air conditioner basically. And you can also see at the top of each one of these sections, it tells you the backup energy, backup power and surge power just for that section. In the last section here, we have this heavy appliances. We just separated out a couple of appliances that <clears throat> are very, very high power that we would, light, we would hardly ever recommend backing up um, with the battery system. So electric vehicle charging equipment, for example, if somebody has a level two EV charger, which is a relatively high speed charger for a home installation, generally those are gonna uh, draw more power than a battery system can output even if the battery system can handle it, electric vehicle batteries are actually much larger than people uh, really understand. They're much larger than the size of a home battery system in most cases. So if you try to charge your electric vehicle with a home battery, it's gonna deplete that battery extremely quickly. So I would recommend homeowners not back up their level two charger, but if they do need to add a few miles of range to their car, they can use the trickle charger that came with the vehicle Normally, electric vehicles come with a little charger uh, in the trunk that plugs into a regular outlet, and it draws enough, it doesn't draw too much power uh, for most battery systems. But again, it can drain the battery over time, so I'd recommend plugging it in for a few hours to add a few miles to the range, but not trying to recharge the entire vehicle with a home battery. And similarly, tankless electric water heaters, these are water heaters that um, don't have any sort of storage tank, obviously, by definition, so the water flows over a heating element and it heats it up to the right temperature instantly. It, those types of water heaters demand a huge amount of power, so do not try to back up tankless style electric water heaters with a battery. And you can also add appliances. You can see the add appliance button here under heavy appliances. It's also gonna be here at the top as well. So this is here because say a customer has more than one air conditioner and the uh, the characteristics of those air conditioners are, are very different. So you've got a kind of a small air conditioner for a small portion of the house and then a large air conditioner for the larger spaces. You can click on add appliance and add another air conditioner here and enter the exact specifications of that air conditioner so it does an accurate sizing. Now, if you are using this and you get this error that says the change could not be applied as it would make the energy consumption more than you specified, this is just sort of a, um, an, I guess, idiosyncrasy of our of our system, of the sizing tool where it's it's comparing the energy consumption that it's calculating to the energy consumption that you entered at the beginning 
So if it calculates the energy consumption of all these appliances and it's a lot higher than the number you entered at the beginning, that's gonna flag that error. So if you wanna get around that error, I would re recommend just coming back to uh, the energy consumption number, which you can find under this bottom section here. So click expand and increase the energy consumption number If you do that, it's gonna change the recommended solar system size, so just be aware of that. Um, most of you are likely using a different tool for sizing the solar system anyway. Uh, so just take the solar recommendation with a grain of salt and use this primarily for sizing the battery system. It's one more thing to note about this section down here is that it tells you uh, there's this little message that says get backup of 16 plus hours and seven plus days. So what does this mean? So if you can click the little information or uh, mouse over the information button here and it tells you what that little cloud basically represents. This estimate of 16 plus hours assumes that there's no solar production coming in. So if you've got a series of cloudy days where solar production is very, very low, then this battery is gonna last about 16 hours before it's exhausted. However, if this is a, um, if during this blackout period there is abundant sunshine day after day, then that customer is going to have backup power basically day after day after day until there isn't enough sunshine to recharge the battery. So that's why it says seven plus days right here. Within this tool, there, there's also a, a way to verify the main panel compatibility. This is something that I would recommend having your uh, electrician where you work evaluate um, rather than using this tool. And then once you've done your system sizing and you want to save your work basically, I recommend downloading it, this PDF to your uh, computer. So on the left hand side, you can see download. Click that, it's gonna create a PDF and instantly download it to your hard drive. I'd recommend putting this in, into your kind of customer file. And if you uh, want to share this with the customer, as I mentioned before, this will give that the customer confidence that the system is designed really for their specific needs, that you're not just kind of throwing a dart and guesstimating the right system size. So now I wanted to move on to um, some, the way that you can get some additional information about large appliances like air conditioners, heat pumps, et cetera, to make sure that the sizing is accurate. So let me bring up another PowerPoint that I've got here. Okay, so if your customer, uh, if the priority for them to have their air conditioner backed up or heat pump or mini split, uh, which is essentially a heat pump that can heat or cool the home, uh, these are becoming more and more popular as, as folks are electrifying their homes and replacing their furnaces with uh, electric heating methods. Um, all heat pumps, mini splits, air conditioners are gonna have a nameplate attached to the outdoor unit and it's going to have some really important information on it for sizing a battery and those two pieces of information are shown here that's the rla which stands for running load amps this is the amount of electrical current that's consumed when this device is running continuously so when it's just humming along this is how many amps it requires and then there's lra this stands for locked rotor amps Again, this is something that applies to motors. That, that rotor is that component in the motor that's, that turns. So essentially when, it, when that pump or that motor first starts, that's when it demands a lot of additional power for a second or two, and that's what LRA or locked rotor amps represents. So again, th these two pieces of information are gonna always be on this nameplate. So take a photograph of that nameplate or write down these numbers. In this example, you can see the RLA is 21.8 and the LRA is to the right, it's 117.
All right, so let's talk about pumps now. So um, occasionally you're going to have a, a homeowner that that feels strongly that their pump, whether it's a well pump or a pool pump, is a priority as well. Pumps are particularly challenging because they have, they tend to have very large motors. Um, so the, the locked rotor amps or the starting surge can be very high with pumps. So similarly, similarly to outdoor units with air conditioners, all pumps are going to have a name plate on them. So again, take a photo or write down these numbers. First, you want to record the horsepower. And this example, I mean, the horsepower is always going to be stated in um, in whole numbers. I'm sorry, whole, like or uh, simply a fraction. In this example, it's two, but it could be like 1.5 or one horsepower. Just make note of the horsepower. And then you would have to go to a simple online calculator, or if you know how to do the calculations, that's even better. But this link right here will take you to a simple calculator where you can enter the horsepower and the voltage of the pump, that's important. And then the code letter. So the code letter is actually going to tell us what the locked rotor amps is for this particular type of pump. It's a little bit different kind of calculation than you have to do with air conditioners. So take note of the code. In this case, it's F. And the calculated locked rotor amps is going to be 48.6 in this case. So in other words, to get the locked rotor amps or LRA with a pump, you typically have to do this calculation because it's not going to be on the nameplate. So it's very simple when you think about it. It's just the horsepower, the voltage, and the code letter. Plug it into this simple calculator, and you get that locked rotor amps. So if we come back to the system configurator and go to air conditioner and edit, this is where you can enter in those numbers. So the RLA or running load amps for the air conditioner is going to be under operating power because that's the amount of power it needs to operate or, or to run continuously. Now def the default here is ton. So you want to change this from ton to amps. You can see it says amps parentheses RLA for running load amps. So select that and then enter the number that you got from the nameplate. And the same thing under here. So uh, under daily usage, you can see the default is LRA. You just want to leave it as LRA and enter the LRA that you got from the nameplate. And the last thing you really want to take note here is whether or not a soft starter is going to be used. A soft starter is a little device that actually connects to the, the outdoor unit of that air conditioner and it reduces the required. Uh, amount of amperage to start that. So even though the LRA is technically 78 amps, if you have a soft starter installed, it's going to effectively lower that down to 31 amps. The soft starters um, are relatively inexpensive compared to what it would cost to install a larger battery to be able to start this appliance. So we really highly recommend using soft starters. Um, many solar companies, solar slash you know energy storage companies, require the installation of a soft starter with an air conditioner. So we'll close that and I'm going to select well pump here as well. And you can see with the well pump you have slightly different inputs here for operating power. It does have horsepower, but as I mentioned, the more accurate way of doing this is to use the calculator. Uh, the online calculator that I showed you where you enter the horsepower, the voltage, and the code. And then you know the more precisely what the locked road ramps is going to be. Sorry, so let me let me just step back a second. I think I misspoke there. So the operating power, you could actually leave it as horsepower. That's going to be an accurate calculation of operating power. But for locked rotor amps or the starting surge. You definitely want to do, use that calculator and select R, R, excuse me, LRA and enter the amps that you figured out from using that calculator here. And soft starters can also be installed on some types of pumps. So uh, I'd say check with your electrician to see if that pump can use a soft starter. And if it can, definitely install that uh, to help keep the, the uh, recommended battery size to, to be as small as possible.
Okay, the last thing I wanted to mention here about using the system planner is that if you do have a customer that has multiple appliances that are in this large appliances section that have to run at the same time, then down here in this section where it says appliances you want to simultaneously use on backup, you want to make sure that you select all the appliances that are going to run simultaneously. So if you can, you can uh, see the system size down here change. So right now I have essential appliances and hair conditioner selected, and the recommended size is 20.2 kilowatt hours. If I select well pump, it's going to increase a little bit to 23.5 kilowatt hours. And if we click expand here to see why that's the case, we can see that it's both backup power and surge power. So for this battery to have enough power and surge power, to start and run the air conditioner and well pump at the same time, it needs to be 23 and a half kilowatt hours in capacity. So it's a pretty robust tool. Um, I've poked around the tools available from our competitors quite a bit and haven't found any that where you can do so much fine tuning and such an accurate system size with just a, a few clicks of the mouse. So I highly recommend playing around with this, getting to know it. There's a tutorial video, which I'll share the link with Edgar to that, and he can share it with you guys that goes through kind of basically what we went over. But if you want to review everything that we covered, uh, you know, watch that video and then practice a little bit to get more and more comfortable with it. So the last thing I'll touch on before I open it up to Q&A is are just kind of best practices for doing site surveys. So I'm not talking about a, a site survey that, a, that a, um, a certified electrician would do uh, per se, but these are some simple things that you as a salesperson can simply get photographs of or, or get information on that might just take you five or 10 minutes to do that's going to allow you to really more accurately size the system and anticipate things like main panel upgrades that may be required and may add additional expense. So the first tip is simply to take a lot of photos um, and make sure that when you're taking these photos that you're, uh, if there's any small text, say if for example, you're taking a photo of the label on the inside of the service panel here, uh, make sure that it's well lit and it's in focus. Otherwise you're not gonna be able to read the text on those obviously. Same is true. So yeah, take photos of the main panel and sub panels, the stickers on the inside and picture of the breakers. So you can clearly read the amp rating of all the breakers and labels. And then you also wanna take pictures, as I mentioned, of the labels on any large appliances, if you can get to them, like that central air conditioner or mini split and pumps as well. So here we have an example of a label of a main service panel. It's important to, um, to take note of the, the amp rating of this service panel. So this is essentially how much electrical current the bus bar, that big metal bar inside the panel, can accommodate safely before it would potentially overheat. So these, most panels are have anywhere from like a 100 to 225 amp rating. Some larger homes might have 400 or 600, but the vast majority of homes are gonna be 100 to 225. In this example, it's 200. Now, sometimes the label is going to be missing or unreadable. In those situations, you, you, you have to just assume that the, the size of the main breaker, the rating of the main breaker, is equal to the panel bus bar. That's a nice segue into the main breaker rating. So the, the, the main breaker is, is going to be the largest breaker in the panel, or it might be actually in a, in a, a different location than the main panel. Oftentimes it's gonna be within the other, like in this, on the same bus bar as the other breakers, it could be at the top or the bottom. In some cases, it's gonna be nestled in the middle. And in some types of uh, electrical setups, it's gonna be a separate breaker, separate from the loads, as you can see in the picture on the left here. So you gotta find that main breaker and make sure you note the rating of that breaker. It's oftentimes gonna be the same as the bus bar, but it's common for it to be less if the main breaker is a lower number than the bus bar, then that's gonna allow you more capacity basically to, to backfeed solar and or storage.
and a couple more items here. If the system, if you're retrofitting an existing system, say the customer already has an end phase, uh, end phase solar system, you want to make note of what the size of the system is and which microinverters they have. You can connect an end phase IQ battery to these models here, IQ7s, IQ6s, M250s or M215s, as well as, of course, the current generation of IQ8s. It's not listed here, but um, IQ8s are, of course, compatible as well. See, uh, if you don't have um, the information isn't anywhere obvious, like on a you know stickers on the, the service panel, you might have to contact, ask the customer to provide a copy of their contract if they still have it. Uh, or if your your company actually installed this original PV system, you can log into Enlightened Monitoring, the Enphase Monitoring System, and you can actually see the specs of what they have on their system. So you can get the information that way as well. Now you may, depending on how your company operates, you may be also responsible for at least uh, doing a preliminary location of the components of the system, making sure that there's enough wall space before you get a signed contract. So a couple of best practices here. First, the uh, what's called the N-Power in this picture is now called the system controller in our documentation. That's the smart switch of the system that disconnects from the grid. It's a pretty big device. It's about three feet tall and a foot and a half wide. And the ideal location is going to be relatively close to the main service panel because you're going to have to run large conductors uh, from the service panel into that N-Power smart switch. And it can be installed inside or outside the home. And for the batteries, um, N-Charge 10, which is now called the IQ Battery 10 or the in the IQ combiners, the closer these components are to the end power, the better the wireless communication is going to be between them. If they're if they can't be installed close together, it's optimal for them to be within line of sight of each other because of they're communicating wirelessly. So if you're putting the end power on the outside of the building, you might consider putting the batteries on the outside of the building as well. There's a gap, a minimum gap required of about six inches between components. Uh, to allow for bending conduit and um, uh, for the battery to be able to, to cool properly. And there are also some code requirements for clearances from the ground to the ceiling. So if it's inside a garage, for example, it has to be at least six inches off the floor. That applies to both the, the uh, system controller and the batteries. And it has to be six inches away from the ceiling. And if it's installed outside, the battery can still be within six inches of the ground. However, the N-Power smart switch, because it has a lot more electronics and it's not a sealed waterproof enclosure, it has to be 36, 36 inches off the ground or three feet. This has an example here. So if you had a relatively simple system with a system controller and one IQ battery 10 and an IQ combiner, and they all were right next to each other, that takes approximately seven and a half feet of wall space. Add another uh, IQ battery three to that scenario and you've got about nine feet of wall space that's needed. If you had two IQ battery tens side by side with the other components, that's about 11 and a half feet of wall space. And what a lot of installers do to save space is to put the batteries basically on top of each other or uh, you know one above the other so that you can still fit a, a 20 kilowatt hour package within about seven and a half feet of wall space. Now what does doing this extra work do for you? <laughs> In my opinion it demonstrates expertise to that homeowner that's going to give them confidence that they're not going to get things like change orders and increase of the system cost after they've signed the contract. Uh, that's the last thing that a salesperson or a homeowner wants to see is a change order because uh, a site evaluation or site survey wasn't really done properly. It allows you to accurately size the system right off the bat. So if that customer, uh, you know, it's best 
to be able to figure that out right off the bat so you can get a signed contract and again you don't have to change that system size at a later date. Sizing the system accurately of course allows you to propose an accurate price right off the bat and it shows the, the homeowner that you're going the extra mile for them. All right, now I'd love to actually just open it up to a Q&A. I covered a lot of material here. Um, so please go ahead and type questions into the GoToWebinar tool or Edgar, if you want to unmute folks, it's, a, it's not a huge group, so that would be fine as well if people would like to actually ask a question. Yeah, for sure. Uh, thank you for that presentation, Tony. It was very informative. Uh, now that we'll, we will begin the Q&A session, um, it looks like we have three questions right now uh, put into uh, this chat. Uh, the first one is, will changing the toggle in the add appliance to I plan to buy this in the future also get around the error? Ah, interesting question. Let's check it out. Okay, so they're talking about um, when you add an appliance here. So just give me a second to get my my bearings. So it looks like the added appliance maybe didn't change. Okay, so but what the the person who asked the question is referring to is when you click add appliance. There are two radio buttons here. You can select either I own this appliance. That means it's going to factor it in um, to this estimate. And if I plan to buy this in the future, it's going to factor it into the size of the battery. Um, but it's, I don't, and I, to be totally frank with you, I'm not 100% sure exactly how this, how this impacts the calculation here, but we can do it we can test it out. So I select air conditioner and hit add. Okay, that time it worked. I think it's because I already changed the consumption. So let's just step back a second here. I'm gonna change that consumption back down to like 760 kilowatt hours per month. Okay, it's saying the minimum is 780 based on what's already selected, okay. So basically, if we add anything uh, or select any additional appliances to back up, um, it's going to give us that error. So let's test this out. So if I add appliance here, select air conditioner, and hit add, boom, we get the error. If I select I plan to buy this in the future instead, and then click add, it does actually not show the error. So that's a, a nice little workaround to know as well. Maybe an easier way to, to get around the error than changing the kilowatt hour input. So yeah, thanks for pointing that out. That's uh, something that I, I didn't know was possible. Nice, that was awesome. Um, great to see it in action as well. Uh, the next question is, how can we calculate how many watts a TV, refrigerator, or basic home backup appliance needs? That's a little bit trickier. Um, the specifications of electrical devices are sometimes in the manual, so you can look it up, try to find that information there. If you don't have a manual, you can purchase there are a few different devices on the market that are about 20 or $30. This is one that I've used before. It's called the Kill A Watt Easy Electricity Usage Monitor. So if there's one specific appliance you want to, to see how much it uses, you plug this in, you plug the appliance into this, and it tells you exactly the power consumption. And you can actually leave it plugged in for a period of time, say leave it plugged in for 24 hours, and it'll meter the kilowatt hour energy consumption 
over that period of time as well. So it can tell you those two key bits of information, the power of the appliance and energy consumption over time if you leave it plugged in. This might, you know, this is something that might take a little bit longer if you're doing a, trying to do a quick site survey. Um, but if you do have the time and you have a good rapport with your customer and can take the extra time to do this, um, uh, again, this is one of those things that's just going to demonstrate your expertise and the fact that you're really sizing the system correctly for their needs. Yeah, nice, Any more nice questions there, Edgar? Yeah, sure. Uh, we have two more, uh, two more so far. Um, the next one is, can we combine the M250s and the M250 IQ7-240 for an IQ battery? So, Edgar, say that one more time, please. I just want to make sure I heard the sure. numbers correctly. Uh, so, can we combine the M250s and the M250 IQ7-240 for an IQ battery? So, I think you might be talking about the power down model. Um, let me bring up a slide here. So for customers that have older systems that have M250s, if they want to add more microinverters to their system, then they typically would purchase what's called a powered down IQ7. So the microinverter looks like an IQ7, but it has firmware on it that makes it operate like an M250. So maybe Edgar, uh, or uh, whoever asked that question, can you clarify in the questions tool if that's the situation you're talking about? If that is the case, if it's a you know an M250 system with some additional IQ7 power powered downs uh, that function like M250s, then yes, they can install an IQ battery with that system. But to be uh, that was what we're referring to. Okay, sorry. great, great. But just to be clear, um, it sounds like you already know this, but the microinverters within a system that has an IQ battery have to be with from one of these three families and they can't be mixed. In general, that's the rule. So if it's an IQ8 based system, you can have any of the, the sub models of the IQ8 series in one microgrid. You could have IQ8s mixed with IQ8 pluses, for example, in the microgrid with a battery. And you can have IQ7s and IQ6s of different models within that those families mixed together, and that system will work fine as well. The reason is because they use the same communication protocol, the same communication language to talk to the, the gateway, the brain of the system. And the same thing applies to M215s and M250s. They can be mixed within the same, but they can't be mixed with the other inverters on the left here. The only exception would be the one that we started talking about, whereas if they have a specific um, model from Enphase that's designed to be compatible with older micros like the M250s, and that would be the IQ7 powered down model, or PD. Great question. Uh, here's a bit of a follow-up to it, just to make sure I, I cover um, everything that's being asked here. It says, uh, we do use the IQ cables, or excuse me, do we use the IQ cables or the older uh, cables with the power down version of the IQ7? That is a great question. I don't know the answer offhand, but Edgar, I will find out and I'll email that to you so you can respond to them, okay? Perfect. All right. Uh, the next question that we have is, Uh, will the IQ8 microinverters in solar arrays combine uh, to peak power of the battery backup system during sunlight hours? I'm not totally sure I understand the question. The, <laughs> the microinverters themselves, and of course the power of all the microinverters is additive as well as the PV system with the battery. Um, the power output of the PV system is is always going to be at its maximum level unless there's a specific feature called PCS or power control system that's implemented. That's that's not very common, but generally speaking, the PV system is going to produce as, as much power as it can. 
um, at all times, and the battery can only absorb so much power. The, the power output of the batteries is the same as the charge rate of the batteries as well. So the only time that the, the I mean, there are going to be instances when the PV system is going to reduce its power output, and that's when it's disconnected from the utility grid. So if the entire system is off-grid, then the PV power uh, sometimes needs to be curtailed so that it doesn't overload the batteries. And that's an automated feature. It doesn't have to be programmed. It's just inherent to how the system operates. And on that note, the IQ8s, because they're they're the latest generation, they have much faster microprocessors in them, they're able to kind of ramp their power output up or down a lot faster to provide a more stable uh, microgrid experience for the homeowner compared to older models. I'm not sure if that answered your question or not. Um, if it didn't, you know, please clarify. Yeah, so they, they did drop in a few more uh, comments on it. So. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> for what they said here, it says uh, the addition of a sunlight backup system added to a battery output. Does that? Okay, yeah. So sunlight backup is is uh, by definition it's a system that doesn't have a battery. Um, so if you are integrating a battery with the an IQ8 PV system and the system controller, that is essentially a battery backup system. And as I mentioned, the power output of the solar array, when the system is disconnected from the grid, is going to vary so that it provides a stable experience. You know, if the home is using only a kilowatt and the batteries are fully charged, they can't accept any more energy, then the solar system is automatically going to uh, output a kilowatt of power. It can't produce more power than is that's being consumed by the loads in the battery. Otherwise, you would have an instability in the microgrid and it would collapse. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah. It, it, it really is just fundamental to how the system operates. The IQ8s are going to vary their power output um, based on the demand of the loads as well as charging the battery. Perfect. Um, this was kind of a follow-up to a previously asked question regarding uh, the, the, um, the sizing for a battery. Um, there, you, there used to be a short video that showed, uh, you know, how, how to size a battery for running a TV for two hours and so on. Uh, is there anywhere in the Enphase library that this video still exists or something similar that we could potentially share with customers here? Yeah, sure. Let me. I should have a link to that video actually in this deck right here. All right, so here it is. Um, Edgar, I'll put it into the chat here, and then you can share it with the whole group. Perfect. There. All right, it seems like we have another question here. Uh, if demand exceeds battery output, the battery composed of IQ8s, uh, will rooftop solar cover the extra demand that is beyond what the battery can output? Yep, absolutely. When I when I talk about this, the system being additive, that's what I'm talking about. The power of the battery, I'm sorry, the power of the solar adds the power output of the battery. So again, we're talking about when the system is off-grid and it's relying solely on battery and or PV. <clears throat> The, the system is going to prioritize PV first. The PV is going to be outputting at its maximum power rate, uh, maximum power to supply the loads and charge the battery. 
Um, if the loads exceed what the PV system is, is outputting, then the battery will instantly go from charging to discharging so that it, it can supply enough power for those loads. So when you're doing your calculations, you can assume that the full power of the battery and solar, I'm sure yeah, that the system will have the full power of the battery plus whatever's available from that solar system at that moment in time, which depends, of course, on irradiance. But the two are additive, absolutely. Perfect. Okay. Uh, well, I don't believe there are any further questions. Uh, so that concludes our live training. Uh, big thank you to you, Tony, for sharing your time and knowledge with us today. Um, uh, yeah, feel free pleasure. to browse. Yeah, feel free to browse the Enphase product lineup at any time via the shop aesolar.com. Uh, thank you for doing business with AE Solar and Enphase, and enjoy the rest of your day.